Hello there guys, what is going on Zala Chelsea? Back here again for another edition of Let's Talk Chelsea. Hope you're doing well and keeping safe on this Wednesday. We've got a lot to get through, we really have uh, in terms of news. There has been so much in such a short space of time. I don't think that's surprising, particularly on like a board structure level, given how much has had to change and had to happen. And uh, you just, you do get a sense now with particular one deal going through it's going to really start to, I think, have a domino effect with Chelsea's transfer business, which I do think is is a good thing in terms of if you want more incomings and I think want to see stuff going on. So we do have quite a bit to discuss today and I'm sure you guys in the comment section will be giving your opinions on it as well. Make sure if you haven't already hit a subscribe button and a notification bell so you don't miss any of the uploads on the channel. Hopefully you're going to have some exciting collabs coming up soon uh, with some fellow Chelsea content creators. I um, used to do it a lot in the past and I think as we're getting into the summer, get some voices on the channel, hopefully debate some things over the big issues regarding Chelsea. So make sure you're staying uh, tuned for that. So make sure you hit that subscribe button and the like button too, because it helps new people find the channel. So let's go on with, with the news this morning, the structural board changes that Chelsea announced on their website, the new board of directors and leadership changes. Little of this was that surprising. I think pretty much all of the names and their positions were pretty much uh, guaranteed. And I think we all knew uh, especially with Todd Bolly becoming a new chairman after Bruce Buck stepped down. I think we all kind of expected that that had been reported and in the works for some time. I feel the biggest thing, and I'll just put up a, an article from Matt Law here from The Telegraph today, Chelsea eyeing new sporting director after confirming Marina Granovskaya's ex exit. We spoke about Marina on uh, Monday about her potential exit, and now it's been confirmed. I felt the most telling thing about this statement was the use of the term sporting director and not only that Bowley was going to basically become the interim sporting director uh, which is an interesting thing in itself given he hasn't worked in European football before and he's going to work basically alongside Thomas Tuchel but the commitment basically to get a sporting director which I think is something that we you know a lot of Chelsea fans have kind of wanted for some time and to actually see it there in an official club statement, I think it was pretty. It's pretty surreal moment. I mean, it's not that surprising. I see like Chelsea welcome to 2022, but it's. It, I think it's a step in the right direction, and of course now that hunt for who who that's going to be. And Matt Law kind of broke it down post Marina, uh, bringing up Michael Edwards, who of course left Liverpool. Um, there are some names in there that we've kind of heard. It, it's it's. I think the moment is just speculation. I, I think that you're just hoping now that they get the right person, and and can bring someone in who can kind of merge two things can kind of improve the long-term planning the structure the recruitment but also particularly in my opinion and I think other people and, and Chelsea Youth I think tweeted earlier I think it made a lot of sense in terms of really appreciating Cobham and that pathway into the first team so we'll see on that front but I do want to get on to Lukaku um, because it was kind of confirmed last night apparently he's going to have his medical next week with Inter Milan and then officially both clubs will confirm the deal but it basically is done uh, Romano giving it the here we go last night Lukaku returns to Inter full agreement now signed on loan deal until June 2023 an 8 million euro uh, loan fee plus add-ons Lukaku's salary will be around 8 million no buy option or obligation clause add-ons related to team performances there was no way Chelsea came out of this deal looking good. I, I feel like the only positive that has come out of this is Todd Bowley acting quickly and swiftly on something that could have dragged on and on and on throughout this summer and dominated things, potentially halted other business Chelsea have to do, which is quite a lot. So I feel that's a, a real positive and a proactive move to get a, an awkward problem resolved. Again, there's no way. This is probably the worst transfer Chelsea have ever done. And... I think a lot of the analysis we've had is solely on Lukaku. And I, again, I'll reference Matt Law, but I, other people brought up, I've brought up myself, I wrote an article about it today. There has to be criticism of Tuchel. And I think there is pressure on Tuchel now, and particularly heading into next season when he's not. And I think a lot of people are not going to have Lukaku to pin blame on anymore. Um, if Chelsea's attack, even with new additions, continues to falter in the same way, I don't think it's going to reflect that well on Thomas Tuchel, um, particularly if he gets, as I say, new signings. Some of the targets we've been hearing, you know, Usman Dembele, Raheem Sterling. If he gets some of those players in and we're still seeing a very unproductive attack, I think questions and criticism are rightly and I think fairly going to go on his shoulders. Um, and, you know, you bring back sort of the Tammy Abraham situation last year, which I think has come up in recent days. You know, the longer Chelsea's attack doesn't click, selling him doesn't look like a great move. So... 
there is pressure on Tuchel. You'd hope that there is going to be improvement. We really do need improvement. I wish for improvement in the, in the final third. But I think there needs to be that nuance, right? Lukaku made mistakes, clear mistakes, particularly the interview, which changed everything. I do just want to point this out because I don't think many other Chelsea creators will be speaking like this um, and will reference this because it's not that sort of uh, trendy to say this because you probably get a lot of criticism for trying to defend Lukaku in any way. I'm not defending what Lukaku did with the interview, but I have found, and I said this on Twitter, I have found the abuse towards Lukaku and kind of the atmosphere around Lukaku a bit hypocritical and particularly on the abuse front because it kind of I think a lot of us have been irritated frustrated fighting against abuse of say the likes of Mason Mount and Reese James or any Chelsea player you could pick any Chelsea player in the current squad they've been abused at some time that is unfortunately the awful side of social media but I did feel there was an environment post the interview and even in recent weeks as it's, as it's got closer and closer to him leaving where People have just kind of turned a blind eye to it and at some points egged it on. And it's like, you know, do we care about abusive footballers or do we not? Lukaku made mistakes. Lukaku has done things that rightly has gotten criticism from Chelsea fans. But to act like he's this villain, this antagonist, I don't like it. I don't think it's it's very helpful. I think you lose the moral high ground in situations when you start act, acting like that towards any player. There are players within the squad who I think should be sold, but I'm never going to refer to them in that way. I'll criticise their performances. I'll criticise their flaws on the pitch. Um, but get, I think it just speaks to why this needed to happen because it was just unhealthy. And we, if we went into the next season with Lukaku still doubt over whether we wanted to be here or not, and he hadn't made it so clear he wants to go back to winter, and the moment he starts doing things wrong on the pitch, he had a, he has a few bad performances. He misses a big chance. You know, the pile on would be there instantly. So I think this is the best solution for all parties. But I just did, did just want to point that out. But let's move on now to a potential target this summer that we did mention on Monday's episode, but I think there's been more sort of concrete reports about this from Nazar Kinsella, and it is about Jonathan Klaus from Lens. Uh, Chelsea I 10 million France international to replace Aspilicueta. Klaus had the most goal involvements for a defender in the big five leagues last season at Lens, scoring 11 goals and getting five assists. In regards to Klaus, Chelsea have done their due diligence watching his last 50 matches and having identified him as a target shortly after Tuchel joined the club. Nazar Kinsella does kind of uh, bring up that Klaus in the past has done interviews with French media saying that as a kid he was a Chelsea fan, his dreams play for Chelsea. He is a right wing back as well, just to make that clear. Um, Klaus, I actually did a bit of work uh, on him today for an article that's coming out tomorrow morning uh, on Football London um, looking on my scout looking at some of his numbers um, looking at some of his attributes and watching quite a few clips of him and initially yeah like I, and I, I'm not going to sway away from this uh, even though there are positive things of course the class is not you know this is not a binary thing here and I said as much on Monday um, of Sterling, of the idea of promoting an internal solution, particularly one like Sterling, who has proved himself pretty versatile. And as I said on Monday, and I'll keep saying this, I just think it's a smart option for Chelsea to look at all of these loanies, for Tuchel to look at all of these loanies and give them an opportunity. No one is sitting here and making the argument that some people try and even in my comments try and make out that we just want a, a, like a whole squad of academy players. That's unrealistic. Um, all I would like to see is for Chelsea in what is a very tricky summer transfer window where they're not going to be able to get all of their dream signings done. It's unrealistic. And, you know, you even if they want to get a lot done, just deals, the complexity of getting these deals done, the time frame now. The fact that Bowley is, is coming into a situation where, you know, he hasn't worked in European football, football before. And although there's the excitement over a future sporting director, we're not sure how this is going to work out this summer. If you can bring in a few and promote a few academy players, that can save you money and also a bit of time as well. French League has proved pretty successful for Chelsea um, in terms of recruiting from there. There seems to be a nice sort of balance between the Premier League or at least comparisons you can make between the Premier League and the French League compared to others. So say like the German League, there have been these problems of particularly attacking players coming over and finding it difficult. Um, other leagues across Europe, maybe, you know, as we've seen with Hakim Ziyech from the Eredivisie, there seems to be maybe that physicality that's a little bit similar. 
And as well, you look at the deal for Edward Mendy and looking at the price of the, and exactly why Nazar Kinsella references Aspilicueta, looking at the price that's 10 million under 10 million for a player who could come in and offer a decent backup option. I mean, I don't think it's quite similar to Aspilicueta because when we did buy Dave, you know, he was still um, early mid 20s. You know, he was still had years left to go in his career. You are buying someone very much in the prime later years of their career, even though he has kind of increased his quality in recent years, like you know he, he is maybe what you'd refer to as a late bloomer um but still i mean if if it was 10 million if it wasn't ridiculous wages if i'd be looking to give this guy like a two-year contract at, at a max at this point and he'd be happy maybe with that because he wants to play for chelsea and given his productivity given what took all needs as a backup to reese james next season you can see why I you just watching Klaus and seeing his productivity and seeing some of the numbers for him. You can understand why I think Tuchel likes him. There is a, maybe a bit of physicality problem with Klaus, you know, in terms of just looking at some numbers. And as I say, read the piece I, I, wrote, um, I wrote today and will be out tomorrow uh, regarding, say, his defensive side. You know, the way he's, he's not as physical. Um, he really is kind of that offensive wing back. But, you know, if you want to be more attacking next season, I could see why he could be quite a productive and interesting player for Chelsea to recruit. I know there's a lot of people quite positive about him. There is that debate going on mainly in terms of is it worth spending this money? But, you know, as, as we've seen with Chelsea signings recently, if Klaus adds like Mendy to be sort of a low risk, low spend, but high value signing Chelsea need more of those we need more wins on the board and maybe Klaus could be that this summer so let me know your thoughts on Klaus in the comments below and finally I do just want to speak about Hakim Ziyech um, there have been some reports again and I am getting a bit of deja vu here uh, regarding last summer because there's reports coming out of Italy um, that AC Milan want Hakim Ziyech again and there's even some reports that claim a deal is, is some way down the line we've heard nothing of this on say the English side I mean I know Matt Law was on the London is Blue pod go and give those guys a listen because he he goes on to their pod pretty regularly and it was a pretty extensive breakdown of all the news we've been discussing recently and like Werner and Pulisic Ziyech very much is in the category of he could be sold and maybe out of Werner and Pulisic he's the more realistic to be sold given his age given his wages given what Chelsea originally paid for him um, and I remember all of last summer it pretty much became a bit of a running meme that every week we'd have a story about Hakim Ziyech and the interest of, say, a loan to, to AC Milan, it never materialised. But I remember having conversations and I remember speaking a lot about Ziyech last summer after his first season. And what I was saying back then was, you know, I think it's fair to give him a second season. It's it's, it's good to look at him again. But there are concerns, particularly since Tuchel came in, when he came in in the previous January. Does Ziyech really fit into what Tuchel wants to do? And we did see flashes from Ziyech, particularly in January and February time, where he scored a few goals in the Premier League and, and took all change the formation to kind of that 4 3 3 that was a little bit similar to what he was playing when he originally signed for Chelsea under Frank Lampard. And he looked like the player that we'd bought. And, and you were really hopeful that he could really kick on. I still just wonder with Ziyech if he's ever going to fit into what Tuchel wants. But Ziyech, I'm not out here saying I'd like to sell him tomorrow. I think out of the three, Pulisic, Werner and, and Ziyech, I still think Werner is the one that I'd be looking to sell um, just simply out of quality wise. Um, but, you know, financially what offers come forward, I can understand why you'd make the argument that Ziyech is maybe the more realistic to be sold as well. And particularly at this point of his career, Ziyech probably doesn't want to spend another season where he's on the bench mainly or he because he spent a large portion of last season on the bench but before he kind of came in during those winter months and, and got his run in the team and you still again you look at the system and it comes back to Tuchel and what he has to do with the formation if he makes Chelsea more free-flowing if he makes us more expressive if we change formation if we get the right signings in then suddenly Ziyech probably becomes a more interesting player and probably a more useful player to Tuchel and, and that really suits his game a little bit more um but at the moment, I could see why Ziyech maybe wants to move on and Milan have been the constant link for quite a while now, over a year. Um, so I want to hear your guys' thoughts on this because, you know, particularly if Dembele and someone else, Sterling, I think Sterling kind of feels like the, the big main target at the moment and Dembele's kind of gone a little bit silent and there's confusion over whether he's going to stay at Barcelona or not. So they, they, there's about a week left on that deal when you're kind of wondering what's going to happen there. But let's say if two attackers come in, 
absolutely plus Lukaku one other kind of has to go and they, all those three Pulisic, Werner and Ziyech will be considering their futures and I know there's a lot of people who admire Ziyech his natural talent with that left foot um, but you just look at his Chelsea career so far and is he ever going to be more than kind of a sporadic you know rotational player and particularly if Chelsea are investing heavily on players like Sterling and Dembele the writing is kind of on the wall, isn't it, for a player like Ziyech as it is for others. So let me know your opinions on Ziyech, his future in the comments below. But that is it for today's episode of Let's Talk Chelsea. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to watch it. If you did enjoy it, hit that subscribe button and a notification bell so you never miss an upload. Follow me on Twitter at Sonochelsea and I'll see you again very soon. All the best.